He asked if I wanted to stop by a mutual friend of ours' house because he wanted to pick up some cocaine. And he said, sure. He asked me if I wanted to go up. He knew it had been a long time since I'd seen Peter. He parked the car and we went up there and he had six of his friends waiting for me. I remember them, like, having sex with me. I don't remember them hurting me, like, physically beating me or anything like that. I guess after, like, the third or fourth one, I passed out. And when I came to, they had put me in his wife's running path in the park and left me there. She loaded me up in her car and took me to a hotel room. One of her friends was a doctor and he came over and checked me out. She got round the clock nurses and bodyguards for me. Like three weeks later, my eyes got to where I could see. They were still all black and blue, but they weren't swollen shut anymore. My name is Mars. That's my mother's tacky sense of humor. And I left home when I was 13 because my stepbrother raped me. And I didn't try and find my real father because he was going to have me raped anyway, according to my mother. So I ended up being on the street, living in a lot of different places. And now I live in Boston and I work as a stripper. I think it is very strange that Older men like little girls because they're perverts is what they is. I mean, I like the money, but I don't like them. I used to at le least bring in $300, $400. And for a bulge, that would be 30 on up. And for lay would be like 40 on up. Most of these veterinarian hoes would charge more than, you know, us little kids do. I mean, I used to turn dates a lots and lots of times, you know, just about every day. I'd be pulling dates day and night, day and night. And it's just like I get bashed five times. So I don't pull dates that I don't know. And then uh, make the daddy doing to me the bad thing. Now take off the yes, and Okay. Okay, now you tell me you want me to take you want me to take the pants off? Or do you want to take the pants off? Because the daddy took off the pants so he could put the Okay, what is that? 
Okay, where else does he put it? Okay, what do you call that? Honey. Okay, where else does he put it? Okay, where else does he put it? He, he's, uh, he's a very scary person, and when I look at him, I don't look at him for how do I see him. I look at him for how did he look to my son. Yeah. He must have been very scary in, in the shades of the tree, uh, overpowering him like that. Uh, I can't imagine how, how scared my son must have felt. I only know that he felt very compelled to do whatever he had to do. Uh, and uh, when it was over with, um, he was going to try to find a way to get home. Mm -hmm. um, the people that did find him were really very fortunate that they found him as quick as they did, and they responded as fast as they did, because that's what really did save his life. He makes me sick. From when I was little and he was a pervert and shit, when every time I remembered that, Every time I remember what he did to me, what he took advantage of me and shit. I didn't when know. When I didn't know what he was me. doing, I didn't know it until you started asking me. But you wouldn't tell me then. I told you that he did. When you asked me if he did a certain thing, I said yeah. And then when he went, and told him. Ever since then, he's hated me. Yeah, but he didn't do it anymore. So he's, I still hate him for doing it to begin with. So my stepbrother decided to have a live-in sex partner. So I put up with it for 10 months, and then I left. I told her I wasn't going to lay her stepson anymore to keep her marriage together. It's really not easy being on your own at 13. Your friends all think you're weird, and they don't understand why you can't spend time at ball games or cheerleader practice or whatever. started I remember used to climb into bed with my mother and father a lot my father used to always grab my ass and my mother went to church <laughs> he used to come in my room on Sundays and touch me feel me up and make me do things to him all uh, when he was in the bathroom he used to call me in after he was done doing what he did doing his thing he used to bribe me, you know, he used to take me to the drugstore and buy me stuff every Sunday. At the drugstores on the corner. And, uh, it seemed like a pretty good deal. He took me to the church one night, and we were upstairs in, um, the minister's office. And, um, he was sitting at the chair behind the desk, and so he calls me over. Just give your father a hug. So I give him a hug, and he starts feeling me up or something. So I start to pull away, and he goes, what's the matter with you? Don't want to give your father a hug anymore? And I go, well, I don't like it. I don't want to remember something about him touching me. And I didn't like it, and I just wanted to get away, and I just started crying. So he got really pissed off and started yelling at me, don't love your father no more. <laughs> So we made, so we, we had to leave. So we get home, right? And I'm crying in tears. My father's screaming out. My mother meets us at the door. What's the matter? What's the matter? She didn't want to give her own father a hug anymore. So I went to bed. And everybody was mad at me because I didn't want to give my father a hug anymore. And uh, when my father abused me, I felt like, it, I guess, like it was OK. Like, it happened to everybody. And um, when I got older, I didn't, I felt, I don't know, um, used, like, used in a sense, I really didn't know what used meant. I just felt like, um, is the word I want to use. I felt, I was afraid. And not, my father never threatened to, um, like, kill me or anything like that, you know? He, he was a really intimidating person anyways, but just, like, afraid. Like, it was such a big secret. I felt ashamed, you know? Like, the world was going to find out, and it just wasn't right, you know? Like, I knew.
it was a typical Saturday evening after dinner. He wanted to go out and play, and there was a good two hours of light left, and it was a, a, a reasonable request. Um, mm -hmm. He left, and uh, at about 8.30, I started thinking, well, in my mind, it's getting dark, and so he should be starting to come home. Um, by 9 o'clock, he hadn't come home, and I started phoning various friends and discovered that he wasn't at any of those places. Uh, I started looking for him, um, thinking the whole time that as soon as I get home, he be he'll be there, and I'm just going to really give it to him. Mm -hmm. But, uh, of course, he wasn't there when I got home. And then the panic starts to escalate because you start running out of alternatives, although you keep thinking there must be something else happening that I'm just not thinking of. Yeah, is he at Josh's house? Yeah. Is he at this house? Yeah. He, he must have gone indoors and he's watching TV and he doesn't even realize it's dark. And there's, there's probably some reasonable explanation, and I'll hear it when he gets home, and then after that he'll, he'll have to deal with the, the punishment. By 10 o'clock, after I'd cruised the neighborhood two, two times looking for him, I had to break down and phone the police. And that in itself is a major step when you have to admit that things have gotten beyond your control. Mm -hmm. The police were very um, sympathetic, and I was really glad about that because I kind of expected more ramifications or more questions from them than just... Yeah, how long is it? Because he hadn't been gone for how long? For very long. He was due back by dark, which technically would have been 9 o'clock, and so he'd only been really missing an hour. But they told me to stay by the phone and stay home, that someone would either phone me or come by. Within an hour, the uh, police officer and the police staff chaplain came to my house. The chaplain by himself is a major statement. I mean, not too many times do those people come to your house. Mm -hmm. uh, I listened as calmly as I could as they informed me that they were pretty sure they had my boy, that he was alive, but that he had been sexually assaulted and he was in the hospital and I needed to go down there. <coughs> I don't remember too much more beyond that. My my whole system started shutting down. All I could think of was, he's alive. And there's something I need to do. And so I got my shoes on, and I got in the car and drove down to the emergency room. And uh, the staff at the hospital was really very, very supportive. Um, my mother had gone with me. And they took us into a conference room. And the chief uh, surgeon or staff, Dr. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Coombs, came in to tell us the details then of what had happened. There was a psychologist there with us also in order to um, help us through this. Um, the more people that are there, the more tragic you know it's going to be, and yet I was not at all prepared for what the doctor had to say. He asked what we'd already been told, and I told him basically nothing. You might as well start from the top, and if I could take back those words, I would love to because the irony was he started from the top. He had been strangled, he had been stabbed, and his penis had been severed, which is not exactly castration, but it is quite a dramatic mutilation. My real dad, I've never known. He could be the guy that's really rich, driving a Mercedes, you know? Or he could be one of these bums on the streets. I don't know. I would, I really want to meet him. For all I knew, you know, he could be one of these dates rolling around. I could have dated him for all I know. No child should, as happened to my child, have a judge deem their risk of rape to be 50% and to have unsupervised visits increased 400%. That should not be allowed. If there's a risk of abuse, the child must be protected until it is known that the child will be safe. In my case, we are drowning in evidence. You almost never in an abuse case have what we have, which is an articulate child giving a consistent story to expert after expert, incest experts confirming the abuse as among the worst they have ever seen, an eyewitness account from an older sibling, both girls with the vaginal scars of sexual penetration, and the older girl having a founded case in the Social Service Department of Virginia. Also, I had 
more resources than any other protecting mother. I had more evidence and more resources. If my child cannot be safe, no child in this country can be safe. The day that my child is safe is the day that there is hope for other children. She was a three and a half year old child who was able to tell me very complex sexual uh, details. And at the same time, she was showing the what you would think would be the appropriate emotional response to that. Shame, guilt, fear, uh, sometimes terror, um, anger, uh, all those things at appropriate times. And to imagine that a three-year-old could be coached to carry out that level of complex behavior uh, without somebody in the room, you know, helping her do that uh, is just ludicrous. No, I don't know about other children. Hillary could not have been coached to tell such a story. I mean, she was was a very disturbed child. She couldn't have been maintained any, any fiction. She was in physical and emotional pain all the time and was talking about what was making her suffer. I mean, when she began to talk about the abuse, she'd often just start to scream and she'd fall on the floor and just claw the air and scream for help. I mean, it's just ludicrous to, to think that a child could be acting. She obviously wasn't. You're not going away from your mother forever. Is this a weekend? Your daddy wants to see you. <laughs> I really cannot talk about it. Would you go if your mother took you to my office? <coughs> Can you say any reasons why you don't want to go? Because I had not been able to protect her. And I had not been able yet to hide her. What she was asking me to do. just taken out of our home to be sexually molested. I still can't believe that it happened. He made us have sex with him and with other guys, and he's done it with other people. Um, No, I just don't like him. We found out she had been defecated on, that it was smeared all over her body and put in her mouth. The children have to live with this for the rest of their lives. It will never be known whether or not the children were actually molested or whether they were led to believe they were molested. The parents have to live with this. And there's nothing that I can say or anyone else can say to make them feel better. We did the best job we could do with the information that was given to us. Emotionally, I, I'm very distraught. I think we'll see that most all of us are very distraught about this whole thing. I don't know what it's going to do to my son. Um, you know, we've spent many years bringing him through therapy so he could handle it. And now he's going to have to look at this whole thing again, and uh, it's going to be very detrimental. Well, I'm still in shock. I think it's starting to wear off a little bit now. <laughs> but uh, when I first heard it, I just didn't believe it. I thought somebody made a mistake. When this all first broke and my daughter was talking to me about what happened to her, it was really, really tough. A lot of sleepless nights and uh, a lot of uh, questions and just trying to understand what had happened. Well, the jury is working with a standard of proof that is not necessarily the real world. I know my children were molested. I've, I've had my daughter lay in between my husband and I for a whole year because she was so afraid that somebody would come and get her, that they would kill her because she told. Now, that's what I live with. And the world, yes, will think Ray Bucky is innocent. And I just hope that um, you don't send your children to his preschool. It was just, it was, it was, you know, it was really hard stuff to talk about. Um, you know, groups of kids were taken to various places off the campus of the school, and um, 
where various acts were committed. Um, I really, you know, hate to get into the details because mm -hmm. I've done it again. I've done it so many times. Um, but I don't know. It's just that once we were taken away, the acts were committed. We were usually brought back in a short period of time, and it, I guess it would have seemed it would seem to a parent that nothing had happened. Mm -hmm. And I, they, you know, it, it just it was really hard to. As a child, I remember at the time, I can you know remember that it was just so hard to talk, try to talk about it to anybody because you were just scared. Mm -hmm. You're really scared, and these things you couldn't you couldn't just come out and say, you know, Mom, I have a question. It was really hard to do. Well, I wanted to find out if they're going to jail or not, and for the last five years, I had no doubt in my mind. I thought they were going to jail, and when I heard the verdict not guilty i mean a chill just when it goes throughout your body and it's like tears running down your face but not tears it's it's really bad well i was molested uh, physically and i'm not going to go into detail and uh and the uh, 13 counts that I think that they called a mistrial, uh, uh, dealing with the satanic church and stuff like that, I was involved in that too. And it's not, it's not, 500 kids don't come up with the same story and just make up, make it up. I might just add to that, it was equally as difficult for us to listen to what he had to say. And I can imagine how hard it was for him to tell it. It's not a story, it's what really happened, it's facts. And, you know, it's... It just hurts me to think that Ray is still out there. I saw what the system did. I saw how it treated children. I saw how it treated adults. It doesn't work very well. It didn't work for either side. And now everybody, it's a very safe side to be on, saying, gee, these poor children went through hell. And they did go through hell. But I am not the cause of their hell. Neither is my mother. Neither, nothing that happened at preschool is the cause of their hell. The cause of their hell is the product of the adults who took on this case and made it what it is. If we were lying, I don't think we would come up with such good lies. If this isn't true, I mean, you can do anything you want with me, but it's true. They said that if we told that the devil would come and kill our parents, and he said that we wouldn't live to be the age nine. Molesting me. What does um, that mean? What does molesting you mean? Touching us in places we don't want and then they would like threaten us like oh you don't say a word else we're gonna come to your house and kill everybody except for you and we're gonna send you to the devil and everything and they would scare us really much it's shocking it just cannot be true just, they're just wrong sorry my feeling is we need a guilty verdict so that what's going on around the rest of the world can continue can be have, have something to be based on by saying not guilty you know, everybody's on their own now is what it's going to amount to. Life is not fair. I tell my children all the time, and I did way before this ever entered our life, there is no such thing as fair. Fair is the word in the dictionary. If you think there's such thing as fair, uh, go ahead and think it. doesn't mean anything. You'll always say it was unfair. I'm just real disappointed. You know, we have programs all over the country that tell children to run and tell when somebody hurts them. And our children told. Some of them spent 35 days on the stand, and... Uh, they get a not guilty. Uh, it shows that our justice system needs to revamp for kids if kids are going to be important. One of the things that somehow we, f we failed to impress the jurors with during this trial was the level of fear that these children experienced and still do experience. The uh, University of California has just completed a longitudinal study on this population and the most significant piece of data from that study is that many of these children, six years after the trial and significant number of years after the experience, still suffer from abnormal levels of fear about whether or not the world is a safe place to be, about whether or not they are going to be safe, about whether or not their families are safe. And really what happened at the school involved terrorist tactics against the children. And they really did believe that they might die and that their parents might die. And that fear and that feeling of powerlessness is still there for did many Did you ever believe children. that, Brian? Yeah, at the time I did. The system worked well for them. They were lucky. And uh, I hope to God that, uh, that none of us ever hear anything in the future about either one of them molesting children. These people are not quite all on kilter. We're talking, they're believing nationwide conspiracy of ritualistic satanic abuse, pedophiles in preschool settings, 
And gee, we didn't find one shrap of evidence in a nationwide conspiracy to back that up. That's their belief. Every, every teacher in Manhattan Beach is a child molester. Every preschool that was ever closed with allegations is a, it's a conspiracy of child molesters. You listen to them, and they're talking witch hunt. That's plain and simple. That's what they're talking. Daddy um, was heading the meeting, and he wore a real life's baby foot around his neck. She says they each drank the blood, and then they all hurt me. I said, how did they hurt you? She spread her legs and pointed to their crotch and says, right here. Jimmy talks about having a gun held to his head, about being shown a skeleton, about having to touch the skeleton. He has drawn pictures of a child being sacrificed. Uh, he's talked about animal sacrifices. He's disclosed molestation. The stories are so outrageous, and I am such an honest person. I assumed everybody would believe me. And to this day, I'll get in the middle of a story, and I'll think, they're going to think I'm crazy. This sounds crazy. But when you begin to hear this same thing time and again, different stories, but the same, the same horrible underlying things, the same behaviors in the kids, I just want to scream. That's the baby right there. Right here? Uh-huh. It came out of her already. What'd then, they do to the baby? Then David took it and kept throwing it against the wall, and, it, and he killed it. And he took it in the house. No, you saw that? Yeah. They took it in an old caboose. And they had these things they called spades. Spains? Yeah, spades. They stuck it up my butt. Who Was stuck it? it? David. Your dad? Uh-huh. Ow, did it hurt. Did there come a time where you started to wonder where Carol was? Yes, um, we had watched it, a movie on the video. We had a video for Sleeping Beauty. And, uh, when, the, when that was over, we uh, were working on a puzzle. So we really weren't watching the clock or anything. And uh, I don't recall whether I went out to the kitchen and noticed what time it was, but I said, gee, Carrie's not home yet. And that's when we became alarmed. I saw my daughter's Volkswagen in the cul de sac. Did you approach the car at that point? I slowed down and I stopped my car. And I stopped it because I wanted to, I, I knew. Did you suspect your daughter was not alive? I knew. I walked up to the officer, who was a commanding officer, and I looked at him. I'm man to man, eye to eye. And he started crying. And he told her my daughter's been. Did you then tell your family? Mm -hmm. Yes. While we're talking, Jason I went on back into the house, left me out there on the porch by myself. Then the last question he asked me was, well, is your mother and father home? And that time he was still wobbling his head back and forth to look into the house when he asked that question. What happened then? Well, he kind of turned around, so I started to close the door. But I felt a push on the other side. He had approached the door and pushed it open with his hand. He closed the door behind him and threatened. He said, I have a knife. I hurt your brother and you if you don't cooperate. He started rubbing my breast and my back. And what happened then? When he had told me to get down on the floor, and I didn't respond, so he pushed me down onto the floor. He started unbuttoning my pants and started to pull my jeans off. And what, what did I, you do? What did I do? I closed my legs and rolled over. What happened then? He rolled me back onto the mat to my back. He took his fist and had punched me in the forehead because I wouldn't take my jeans off as he requested. By that time, he started unbuckling his belt and unbuttoning his pants that he had on in this zip, unzipped his zipper. Did you see him do this? 
Yes, I did. What happened then? He told me, take your panties off, you bitch. That's literally what he said. What happened then? I was on the back, on my back. I yelled out for Jason twice. I said, Jason, Jason, help me. What happened then? He grabbed my ankles and pulled me down. In the same motion, he kind of got on top of me and started to try to kiss me. What did you do? I tried to push him away or, you know, move my head. What happened then? He put the blankets, the corner edge of the blanket in the sheet in my mouth and put my arm behind me and held both of my wrists with his hand on one side of me. You know, while he was doing this, he was uh, basically on top of you, correct? Or holding me down. I mean, he was moving so he could do this, but... What happened then? He kissed and touched my breast, and then he pulled my underwear down, and he had oral sex with What happened after he had oral sex with you? Then he had sex with me. Okay, vaginal sex? Yes. After he had vaginal sex with you, what happened then? He, he rolled me over and kind of pushed me up the side of the bed. And then, and, and then he had anal sex with me. Did he ejaculate? I think so. What happened then? After that, he just kind of pushed me aside and got up and to leave. Did he say anything before he left? Yes. What did he say? He, he said that to go ahead and tell Ted because no one would believe me anyway. Ted was your boyfriend? Yes. Did you report this to the River Falls Police? Yes. Did anyone go with you when you reported this? Yes, Ted. Why did you report this on, on March 18th? Because everyone encouraged me to do so, except my dad, and, and I wanted to do the right thing. Why didn't you report it earlier than March 18th? I just couldn't even think about it then. Force his penis in my mouth, and he would he would hold my head down. Oh. And me. Me suck him. And he would say, and I would want up. And he wouldn't let me up. He would just, and I'd be gagging. I would be thinking he was gagging me to death. I would feel it. I mean, he, he would just hold my head down and I'd want up. He wouldn't let me up. And he told me, that that was what I had to do. And then he would go in my mouth and that would make me swallow that stuff. And I would, I'd be gagging on that nasty stuff. And he would laugh at me. I think it was his joke. And I would run to the bathroom and start throwing up. And he would laugh at me. He made me, he made me feel like I was just a trash. I told him I didn't want to do it. It was against my religious beliefs. And he said that I had to do it anyway. And he would do it in front of my kids. We would be on our way to visit my parents. He didn't want me to do it in the car. The officer told me to get in the car, and he directed Jim to pull around the patrol car and uh, further ahead into a grassy area in front of where we were. When you got to the trooper's car, was that area also dark? Yes, very. What happened next? He asked me had I had sexual intercourse with Jim just then, and I was a little foggy. I said. I had thought for a minute, and then I said, uh, no. 
because I remember having a Tampax earlier. And he told me that he would have to check and see. And he told me to lower my jeans. Did you lower your jeans when he told you to? Yes. After you lowered your jeans, what happened next? He used his finger to check and see if I had a Tampax on. What did he do with his finger? He inserted it in my vagina. What happened after that? He told me that he did not feel anything, but there was another way that I could be in the car and on my way. Did he indicate to you what he wanted you to do so you could be on your way? Yes, ma'am, he did. I don't remember the exact words, but I knew that he meant oral sex. What did you do when you got behind the patrol car? I went down on, I was down on my knees. He removed his penis by unzipping his pants. And I, we were engaged in oral sex. He had a knife at my throat and he kept saying, get naked. What kind of knife was it to the best of your memory? Uh, it looked like a kitchen knife. Do you remember about how long it was? Uh, about that long. Okay. Did you say anything to him? I kept begging him just to leave me alone. Did he leave you alone? No. What were you thinking when the defendant woke you up and held a knife to your throat and had you take your clothes off? I was scared. What was the next thing that the defendant said to you? He just, he didn't really talk that much. He just kept touching me and kissing me. And Where did the defendant touch you? All over my body. Okay, could you tell us in a little more detail? Um, on my breasts and in between my legs. And... Did he, what part of his body did he touch you with? His hands. Did he ever touch you with his mouth? Yes. Where did he touch you with his mouth? My breasts and in between my legs. Did the defendant ever have you do anything to him? Yes. What was that? He made me put my hand on his private areas. On his? Yes. Did you do that? Yes. Did the defendant ever make any threats to you? Yes. He told me to act like I was enjoying it and not to make any noise so he'd kill me. After the act you've already described, did the defendant do anything else? Yes. What did he do? He made me have intercourse with him. Now, did you ever attempt to yell? No. Why not? I was scared he'd kill me. When the defendant had intercourse with you, did he say anything to you? Uh, yeah. What he you asked if I'd like it better if it was big and black. Did you respond to the defendant in any way? I just, I just kept begging him to leave me alone. We would have cut money off at the pass right in Utah. As soon as the, um, he, had, he had killed the girls in, in the Northwest and then moved to Utah, and the, all of a sudden they stopped in the Northwest. But then they started in, in Utah. If there had been a bycap, that information would have been collected, collated, analyzed, and both those agencies would have known about the tremendous and great similarities, and, and he would have been stopped in the past. So all, some of the young ladies in Utah, uh, the women in Colorado, and, and uh, the, um, the girls at the college at Florida State would be alive today, including a little 13-year-old, would probably be uh, uh, very, uh, a happy young bride someplace instead of moldering in a grave somewhere. But she'd be going to a Valentine's dance next month. She'd probably be married by now. She'd probably have children. Uh, this evil man came to our community and took it all away from her. It's rough for him because it still bothers him. And that he can't do nothing about it, what happened to his daughter. But he would like to. I'm not sure anyone um, knows how he got in. Um, all the girls left there individual rooms unlocked. Um, of course, nothing like this had ever happened before and we had no reason to be afraid for our safety. Um, the doors were locked downstairs, so mm -hmm. um, he just walked in, I guess. Um, I don't remember anything. Um, I woke up in the hospital room um, two days later. We will never turn it off. 
after a few years, we said we wouldn't turn it off. And now it's kind of a memorial. It will burn forever. I think every time his name comes up, and he, um, the appeals he gives and everything, just reopens, rehashes the whole thing. You relive the whole nightmare again from start to finish, continually. And so I want him to be executed, done away with, so that we don't have to hear his name anymore. We don't have to live, relive these horrible memories. We can all get on with our lives. I'd want to ask him why he killed my daughter and what he did with her, where he put her body. Having her body is extremely important. And um, three years ago, we did put a marker in for her. So we do have a headstone at the cemetery where we can take flowers and honor her, but um, there's still no body there. It's still an open book, so to speak. So I would hope with all my heart that Bundy confesses and tells us where the body is that we might find it and have that peace of mind once and for all. He should definitely be executed, and, and I guess he should probably have extra time to tell so that we as parents and family can have peace of mind and be able to uh, end our nightmares. He cheated each and every one of us as parents out of raising our children and having a wonderful relationship. And I think he should pay for that. I uh, feel like he deprived me of a very special thing to raise my daughter and to know and love her as she uh, grew into adulthood. I, um, I hope they execute him in the morning. I, I think he deserves to die for all the lives he ruined. I just feel like we as mothers who have lost daughters are so heartbroken and it's so hard to lose a child and uh, not have the opportunity to love them and raise them. And I feel very sorry for her that she has a son that has ruined so many people's lives and destroyed so many young women. And I would imagine the anguish she's going through now as he's confessing to all these murders and the heartbreak that she has to live with. I find myself even, and even now when I'm in a crowd uh, looking for her. Uh... Well, first of all, it was unexpected because those things don't happen to you. They happen to everybody else. You read about them in the paper. They happen in New York City. They don't happen in Ellensburg, Washington. Well, we received a phone call from the university that uh, my daughter was missing, that she hadn't come home. She was a straight-A student, the type of child who just wouldn't normally do those kinds of things. For her not to come home from a meeting was just not right. She just wouldn't do that kind of thing. She just wouldn't. She was easily frightened by um, stories of things happening to other young girls. No one uh, paid any attention to it. It was just written off as a, a runaway. The interesting thing is that if you look at the state of Washington, there had been 12, 14 of these occurrences in a six-month period. I don't think anyone even you know, correlated all these missing girls until we bought an ad in the paper. You know, help us find our daughter. We know something has happened. <laughs> no, I, you couldn't, you couldn't say <clears throat> or do any more than we did, I don't think. For a long time, that bothered me. I thought perhaps something in our training, you know, could have helped her in that situation, but I wouldn't have wanted her any other way. And I think that you have to have um, a society that says that you can conduct yourself in this fashion and feel reasonably safe. Why did he do it? Why did he pick on her? Uh, she would have been his friend if he had given her a chance. I've said from the very beginning that somewhere there was a mother with a hurt deeper than mine. And I'd rather have my daughter than that son. We still don't believe it. It just, just can't be. I keep shaking my head day after day, saying, how can this be? Because our son is the best son in the world. The very normal, active boy. It does bring some relief. We knew many years ago that he was guilty. But there was a finality to it when he did confess. We put an end to, uh, uh, it, plain and simple, I guess you would have to say it's revenge. Um, we'll be able to see her 
murderer punished. That's all right. I I know it's not a very Christian way to be, but I think in this case, revenge is, is needed. Do not feel sorry for Ted Bundy. I feel sorry for his family. The son we raised was a wonderful, good person. We don't understand what has happened to him. And it's not the same person that we raised, that we knew, and, and uh, we know we're confident in our hearts that nothing we did during his raising had anything to do with this. I still want to know. I would have to come right out and ask him and say, did you kill my daughter? Did you abduct my beautiful daughter? And did, did you take her and did you kill her? I would give anything if she would just call me on the phone and say, Mom, I've been in California, and, uh, and I'm coming home. It's, it's fantasizing, and I'll never see her again. I would say he can't continue living because he wouldn't talk about it. I, I couldn't trust him. I wouldn't believe him. Ted Bundy needs to die. He needed to die 10 years ago or longer, and uh, he should not have been allowed to live this long. I say this for each member of my family, and I'm certain for the other families, too. Nothing is ever, ever the same again. I do. I believe that with all my heart. I feel it. And I really think he's a psychopath, and I think that he will murder another girl, and I think the death penalty is a deterrent, and I'm very pleased that that jury had enough guts to recommend it. All I can think about is what he did to her, what were her thoughts, how long did she suffer. And those thoughts are with me all the time. She left for the picnic with her friends, and about 9 o'clock that night, I saw that her boyfriend came up pulling in her car. And I knew right then there was something wrong, and he said, I can't find Denise. He said the picnic was over with for a couple of hours and he had been looking all over for her and couldn't find her. I knew that Denise just would not disappear like that for any reason at all. Well, I feel sorry for them in a way and then in another way. I feel that they should have seen something in his eyes or something somewhere about him to give them a clue that something was wrong. I feel that my life has been completely destroyed for everything he did to the girls, the bludgeoning and the strangulation, humiliating their bodies, torturing them. I feel that the electric chair is too good for him. We thought it was a football helmet. It was all bleached white. It looked like a football helmet or a tether ball. We had this $20 bet going on what it was. And then John jokingly said, well, what if it's a body? What did you do? We checked it out. We could only see the head and uh, the left hand sticking out of the mud. It had rings on it, and apparently she had died screaming. Her mouth was opened. It was the scariest thing we ever did see. When I saw my sister, all I saw was skin on her face, very, very little bit of skin, no eyes left in her head, and most of her hair was gone. Um, there was hardly any skin on her at all. She looked like a complete skeleton that you'd find in a health class in school. It was not pleasant. It was very upsetting. To be honest with you, it scared the hell out of me. Debbie, she, she was a very sweet girl. She was well-liked by everybody. One thing that she really liked to do was write poems. I miss my daughter, Deborah, and I love her more than anyone in the world. I mean, my God, she was only 23 years old. Tell a three-year-old that her daddy will not be back is not easy. And then trying to explain that somebody just blew him away. It's not easy. 
they, then they, then they sliced my th son's throat. He shot them in the head. They were leaving the motel. They were, had gone on vacation. And as they were leaving, this man forced them back into the room, had them lay down, and shot them in the back of the head. The one thing that was not presented as evidence was after he murdered my, my mother, he masturbated and left this semen in a tissue next to her. But this was not introduced as evidence as part of his personality because it's not a crime to masturbate. We buried Debbie in a pink child's casket uh, because she, she liked pink and she was a child. She was a um, little tomboy, you know. She uh, um, liked to play with boys, uh, climb trees, you know. She wasn't afraid of anything. You see there, she's got lipstick on, and I think she was in the sixth grade. She was just getting more out of the, the tomboy stage into the feminine. When I started finding out what was going on, uh, it was too late, because it had been going on for a while. Debbie was going to Planned Parenthood and getting birth control pills when she was 11, 12 years old. I found out that she was smoking marijuana. Uh, I found out that uh, boys were a lot more interested in her than just being friends. Uh, a lot of things that breaks a mother's heart. They arrested her for prostitution and didn't know who she was. She, she thought it was a game. I mean, that was fun for, for people not to know who she really is. She thought she was getting away with something. You think you're raising your kids normal, you know, you're doing everything right. And uh, how she could get involved in something like that, you know, when she'd never been exposed to it, um, I couldn't understand it. I just, I couldn't understand it at all. It would be hard for any father. After all, it's my daughter that I'm looking for. A kid that I cared about, cared that I, a kid that I loved. My last born, my baby. We looked for Debbie for six years. Um, and when they found her, um, I just thank God they found her. I, I sat down at the funeral home for three hours. Telling her all the things that I tried to tell her when she was alive. If you have kids and they're out on the street, you better go get them. Because if you don't, you won't have them. And when they're dead, they're dead. Forever is forever. By the time they started finding all these girls and realized they had a serial killer, um, they were all bones. Not too much evidence you can get from bones. I called the task force, and I proceeded to get the same story that I had gotten for two years. Um, they, they had not made any connection between Debbie and prostitution, and until they do, they weren't in the business of looking for runaways. That was the typical story. And so I told him that I had pulled her picture out of their file. And he said, oh yeah, uh, we, 
we've been looking for Betty Jones, you know, since 1982 because nobody's seen her. It's like they don't matter. That this is common trash. And these are children. And this is my girl. And she's not trash. My daughter didn't do anything wrong. Not a thing wrong. She didn't deserve what she got. When your children die of, you know, a natural illness, that's one thing. But for them to be murdered, you know, is, uh, it's unreal to me. And I don't know if it ever will be. The pain that he's caused. I would like to see him die in the electric chair for the murder of my sister who was innocently, innocently killed in cold blood. I was abused for three years, mostly physical and mentally, but mostly the mental part. I got over the physical, but I'll never get over the mental. There's no way to tell you what this man has done to me and my family. He doesn't deserve to live. Kimmy, oh, she was so cute. She didn't walk, she danced. She was a little girl next door. She was everybody's sweetheart. When things get out of hand and I can't handle it, that's the way I think of her. I would like to have met the woman she would have been. She would have been somebody. We uh, took the, the transformer and hooked it to my genitals and stepped back and took pictures while I'm flopping around. It seemed to never end, you know. He had pictures of guys that he had did did things to kids tied up and with marks on them and things i dug through it trash and found different things at one time i thought it was dog remains later on after the investigation the police come in Three years later, I found out that this is the way they said Bob disposed of some of the waste of the human remains. He put them in dog food bags and set them out in the trash. When James first disappeared, even, we, we begged him to do something to go in Berdella's house to get a search warrant for any reason to try to find my son in there because it had been told to us that he was possibly chained up in the house in there. Mary was very free-spirited as a child, very lovable. I remember when she did good in school, she'd come home, she'd be so proud of her report card. She grew up too fast. She always told me, Mother, don't worry, I can handle it. She couldn't. And he just asked me, Mom, can I go out on the back and get, and get some air? So I told him, sure. Go ahead. So that's where I figured he was until he was out there for quite a little while and then come back in. I seen him when he went out the back door. And that was the last time I saw him. That was the last time any of us seen him. They shouldn't have let him go because if they if they would have wouldn't have let him go, my brother wouldn't be dead. He'd still be alive. I don't think it was wrong. He asked her where she was going, and she said she was going home. And he said he was going to Timber Creek, which is right next to our subdivision. So she took a ride with him. Coco liked to write stories. She was a real uh, happy person. And let it show, because if Opal was for you, you really had a friend. Well, I've kept Opal's room pretty much like she did. Her dolls are still on her bed, just like she kept them. You have to go down and you have to identify your child. And she's there with us, a big silent scream on her face. And you try to understand why anybody could do something like that. Terry was a lovable person. She was involved in choir, singing, church. And she was a very bright, intelligent person. She always felt that she could handle everything. I have a dream that she's going to come back, that the person we buried was not her. Denise was a very trusting, I, I think that probably is the biggest word, 
trusting person. She believed everybody was good, and she thought I was a cynical old lady because I tried to point out to her that some people weren't, and some people would hurt her if she wasn't careful. I was uh, going home from work uh, in the afternoon. I had the radio on to my favorite station, and uh, they broke in with a newscast saying that Denise had, had been found. Um, but that's the way I heard it. I heard it on the radio. And it bothered me so badly that, uh, well, I just couldn't drive. I had to pull off the side of the road and stop shaking. Then I thought about my wife being home and the possibility of her hearing it on the radio. So I just drove home as fast as I could. And by the time I got there, of course, she had already been told. And it happened right about right here, where we walked over to the car and we asked him if he was lost. And then he got out of the car and threatened us, said that if we didn't get into the car that he would kill us. So I ran up that little bank over there to the neighbor's house and Katie was crying and she got into the car. Katie had been so brutalized that Tom said, the only thing that looked like her were the freckles on her face and the braces on her teeth. She was such a good little kid and such a regular kid. To allow a child like that to be destroyed was so horrible. When he did this to my sister, he killed a part of the family. No matter what she did or how she lived her life, she was my sister and I loved her very much.